And can you de-radicalize extremists? Hi, Mark. Yes, of course you can. And uh, uh, of course, I mean, it's a matter of cognitive psychology and uh, people get brought into groups and into beliefs. I mean, all of us have uh, belief systems and we have groups that we belong to and you can break the ties with one group and uh, change the incentives and uh, redirect people to other behaviors and other thought patterns. You can help them see the fallacies in what they were believing. Mm. Um, in the case of uh, ISIS, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, Al it's all tied up with religion. So you have to have a good scholar on your team that helps you. I just did this. I just came back from a month in another country where I was two weeks in the prisons with an Islamic sheikh and myself uh, talking to extremists. And our sheikh would recite the Quran in perfect Arabic from memory. Uh, after asking brother, what ayah are you basing that extremist belief on? He didn't say extremist belief, but you know, mm, what brilliant. are you basing that on? And uh, tell them, no, you, it, that, that's, uh, let me explain the context. Let me explain the translation of that. And every prisoner was sitting on the edge of his seat, leaning forward, arms not crossed, uh, really impressed to hear somebody that could recite the Quran and all the Hadiths and put it all together that way. And they were shook to their core on what they believe. So, so I watched you, it with my own eyes. That's very interesting. You de-radicalize extremists by deconstructing the, the ideology that they've been brainwashed with. That's a piece of it. But you also have to look at nobody joins a terrorist group unless they're getting something out of it. What are they getting out of it? Let's bring in my panel, Dr. Speckard, if you don't mind. I'm delighted to welcome Peter Lloyd, a journalist and author, Rakib Hassan, research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society, and broadcaster Marina Berry. Uh, Rakib, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think that you can de-radicalise an extremist? I think that when we're looking at processes of de-radicalisation, we have to be realistic about the chances of rehabilitating convicted terrorists. In the UK, for example, we've had uh, cases where people have been convicted of terror-related offences, they've spent time in prison, they've participated in home office-run rehabilitation schemes, and once they've been released um, from prison, they've gone on to carry out deadly terrorist attacks. So ultimately, there's a risk-reward trade-off. And I think that all too often within our counter-extremism and counter-terrorism structures, there's been a great deal of misplaced idealism. And I think all too often there hasn't been um, that kind of uh, approach where public safety is prioritised within those structures. And, and I do feel that when we're looking at de-radicalisation, we have to be wary of the possibility that when convicted terrorists who may have a history of duping public authorities in the past, they may pretend that they have detached themselves from dangerous fundamentalist ideologies, when in reality they remain hardened fundamentalists who may well maintain aspirations to carry out terrorist attacks in the future. And the real danger, the real danger, Dr. Speckard, is that some of these criminals are very manipulative and they can pretend that they've been cured when the opposite is the case. Well, you have to understand them well and you have to know them well. And you have to understand what's incentivizing them to act in one way. Mm. And can you incentivize them differently? And can you set that up so that it lasts long term? And if you send somebody out of prison right back to the same group of friends, the same circumstances that got them into it to begin with, uh, you should expect that they might fall right back into it. So, of course, um, you can turn people around, but they can revert just as quickly back to what they were doing if their old grievances, their old group is right there for them. So it's got to be a 360, not just de deconstructing ideas, but also looking at what incentivizes them. And can you remove those incentives and put better ones to redirect them into a better life that's safer for them and safer for us? Peter Lloyd, do you think that thousands of Anne Speckards should be recruited by the West? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I know there's only one, Anne. I mean, Anne, with all due respect to you, um, I just don't find your account very convincing. I don't really have any faith that these extremists can be de-radicalised. I think it's a very nice approach to have. It's very generous on your part and on 
the part of your peers to have these ideas and, and think, oh, you know, we'll, we'll give these people the benefit of the, of the doubt, these hardened criminals, these violent criminals, we will give them the benefit of the doubt. But as Rakim said earlier, these people can't be trusted. And more often than not, they don't want to reform. They actively hate the West. And more often than not, they're quite happy to continue with the mindset they have. Uh, Anne, do you I think... Agree. Uh, do you, have you, do you, have, have you faced uh, this, you know, slight scepticism from, from many that, that actually these people are incurable? First of all, I don't treat people monolithically like that. These people, they're on a continuum. Sure. And sure. there's people that can be treated. There's people that want to change. There's people that have become totally disillusioned. I mean, I've talked to people in the camps in Al Hol and Al Roche that say, I don't need a de-radicalization program. The best one was ISIS itself. And I saw how un-Islamic and brutal they were. I want nothing to do with them. But then there's also ISIS diehards and people that uh, will f try to fool you. And, you know, if you've worked in this field for a long time, you'll feel it. You'll feel that the hatred is there, the commitment is there. And, uh, you know, if you're just a contractor picking up your paycheck and you don't really care and you're rubber stamping everything, you maybe won't notice. But if you're someone that's worked in the field for a long time, you'll see people are on a continuum. And some can't be treated, some won't be treated, and others will, and they'll do well. And there's plenty of success stories of people that were inside ISIS that have come home, that yeah. are living peacefully, and contributing to society. You see, I hear that, and it, it does sound very nice, and it's very optimistic, mm -hmm. but it also comes across as incredibly vague. Every time I look at this subject matter, I never see hard data, statistics that show me... Well, let let me give you a case. Let me give you a case. Matthew al Hassani made a video that he threatened the US. He's now living with his father back in the US, and um, He's no dangerous than any other teenager in the U.S., and he's doing Great. quite well. Laura I'm not, I'm not Hassani came back you know to Belgium. She had joined ISIS. Um, she's going around lecturing to high school students of why you should never believe accounts like this on the Internet, which she was uh, seduced by, and how you should protect yourself, and you should never go into a group like this. Uh, there's two actual cases for you, and I can go on and on and on. So it's data. It's evidence. And you can choose to believe it or not believe it. But of course, there's other cases where people were hardcore. The people that were treating them, I think we're going at it a little bit in a rubber stamp way. And uh, they got out and they did things like the, the London Bridge attack. And right. it's disgusting. Yeah. And we need to be very careful that we don't let those kind of people slip through. Peter. Uh, programs that are good-hearted, as you say. Hey, Peter, uh, Dr. Anne Speckard, clearly what she does is complex and difficult and it's not an exact science, sure. but if she can, if Dr. Anne Speckard can de-radicalise one person, that could save many lives if it were a terror attack that were being planned. Well, I mean, yes, in theory, but at the same time, you have to look at the amount of resources that are going into all of these de-radicalization programs and if they're not really effective for the majority then wouldn't that money wouldn't that wouldn't those resources be better used to prevent these people from becoming dangerous in the first place. I'll come back to you, Anne. Uh, Rakib, the clock's against us. What's your view? Well, my view is ultimately that we have to be realistic when it comes to um, the potential for de-radicalisation. I think my view is that in terms of the punishments that we have in the UK for people who've been convicted of terror-related offences, um, all too often it's been too soft. And as I said, I think in terms of our counterterrorism structures, we have instances of people being referred to prevent, then they fall out of our counterterrorism related structures, and then they go on to carry out uh, terror, uh, terrorist attacks. So what's very clear here is that, of course, you can have cases where there, there are successful cases of de-radicalisation, but you have to really see that cases such as London Bridge, where um, Usman Khan, he had participated in these rehabilitation courses for convicted terrorists, he then went on to kill people in a terrorist attack at a prisoner rehabilitation conference. So I think that much of the British public, they're pretty sick of those cases of fun... It, it, these are fundamental system failures, and they undermine public trust in our counterterrorism structures. And I ultimately believe that the ultimate priority for the UK government is to maximise public safety. Um, Anne Speckhard, I'll give you the last word on this. Marina, the bottom line is that we just want our streets, our cities and towns to be safer, and... It's worth a try, isn't it? I mean, it's like with any criminal, anyone in jail, you want to 
somehow try to work with them and rehabilitate them? Why should an extremist be any different? I mean, I mean I'm going on the, the other side of it now, just because, obviously, both panellists are kind of of the same, same opinion. Um, I think, obviously, we're talking about terrorism, but also, you know, just criminals in general, obviously, rehabilitation programmes will work for some and, like Anne says, will not work for others. And I think that that's kind of where I am on it. There'll be some people that think, like, you, like Anne mentioned, about there being uh, a woman who, uh, who now does lectures on how not to get involved with certain things, um, with those sorts of groups, etc. So there will be people that actually respond to it well, and there'll also be people that don't respond to it at all and don't want to respond to it. And I think that's the way of the world. I think everybody is different. So you're never going to get a, a completely um, you know, a successful rehabilitation process that works for everybody. Uh, Dr Anne Speckard, it's a shame we don't have longer. Just a few seconds. Your final thoughts on this? Because I, I've got to say that I, I understand what Peter and Rakib are saying. It's important to be realistic. But I think the work you do is very important, and I salute you in your efforts. So what are your final thoughts on this? Thank you, Mark, and thank you for the cynicism. But, you know, we do have to be in reality, and the reality is... Um, Unless you're going to kill these people and maybe all their family members, um, you, you can't get rid of them. They're in prison. They're going to get out eventually. And so you have to try something or else you're going to release somebody who is just as dangerous as you're claiming they will be if they go through a program. And you also have to think about who are they radicalizing because this is a prison strategy to go after short-termers. And this is exactly what I just saw when I was working in the prisons a couple weeks ago of somebody that's probably, well, he was just released, uh, that might go to do a suicide attack. That's what I felt, who'd been um, radicalized by hardcore extremists. So if you don't run these programs, the risk is also really high. And of course, prevention is way more important than rehabilitation. We want to reach everyone and stop them from going into this rather than trying to turn them around once they're already in it. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.